I'd like to continue on now with the discussion of the wave particle duality of matter by discussing the um, double slit diffraction of matter waves. So we talked a little bit about the diffraction of light from a double slit. Basically, with light, diffraction patterns can be produced. Um, you have a wave incident upon an aperture, and then diffraction is when the light bends and spreads out after going through a small slit or aperture. All right, This happens here. It's shown here with water waves, but of course it happens with waves, um, all types, light, sound. Um, and the idea is that the wave front is a unit, and it strikes both of these slits at once. Okay, and because it strikes both slits at once, the wave front understands that both slits are there. Okay, so this is the idea that we explored <clears throat> when it came to the diffraction of light. If you cover one slit, then the wave front only sees one slit, and you get the single slit interference pattern. And then if it um, both slits are uncovered, then it sees both slits, this wave front, which you can think of as an entity, an entire entity together. And then you see if it strikes both, the double slit. And there's differences in the single and the double slit profiles as is shown here. The double slit pattern has these um, rings, uh, these dark and light patterns inside that broad central maximum, whereas the single slit has a broad central maximum that's surrounded by lesser uh, nearby maxima. Okay, so you get more wiggles, I guess, in the double slit pattern than the single slit pattern. And it's a characteristic of this. Okay, so the idea was, well, if um, electrons and small particles can act as waves as well, then we can do this double slit experiment with the electrons. So they did. They fired um, these mono-energetic mono electrons. They, they accelerated through a set voltage um, so that they knew the kinetic energy of the electrons. And then they fired these electrons at a double slit. Okay, And then some distance away from that slit, they placed a fluorescent screen with photographic film so that they could see what this pattern looks like. Now it's important when you do this that your slit widths <coughs> excuse me, are small compared to your electron wavelength. So they have to be very closely spaced slits. Um, and you have to have your detector far enough away, um, pretty far away, so that it's at a much greater distance than your slit separation. All right? So that's all the requirements. Now the diffraction pattern that you see, be it light, or electrons um, when you have the double slit is due to the interference of the wave. Um, you have a, uh, a path length difference from the top slit to the bottom slit that's equal to d sine theta for these neighboring waves. And d here is the spacing or distance in between the slits. I know we have a lot of d's uh, when we talk about diffraction, and it's important to know which one is which. So in this case, d stands for the distance in between the two slits when you're doing the double slit. OK, so what they saw was they, um, you can watch what the exposure looks like with time. And as you fire electrons at the screen at the photographic plate, of course, you'll get exposure of that plate each time an electron strikes the screen. And you'll see a little dot. Okay, So if you let it run long enough, you get enough dots. Then over time, you get a diffraction pattern start to build up. So this is what it looks like after just 28 electrons. This is after 1,000 electrons. And this is after 10,000 electrons. And then eventually, if you let it run for a long time, it starts to look just like the light interference pattern that you would see out of a double slit. Okay, it becomes clearer and clearer over time. You get your maxima when d sine theta is equal to m lambda. That's the same one as the equation that was used for light. So what this shows is the dual nature of the electron. The electrons are actually detected as particles at a localized spot. They form little dots on the screen, and that's very particle-like. But their pattern, the overall interference pattern, is dictated by the wave nature of the electron. In other words, it's interference, which is something that only waves do. Now I have an active figure on your course website that you can see um, this. So if you scroll down here to active figure 4022, wait, 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 where did it go? Oh, it's all the way down here. Sorry. I'll make sure that you can see it when you, when you do yours. But here it goes. So this is the viewing screen um, for a simulated 
two slit electron diffraction pattern. And we can have a firing rate. We can turn our beam on here, slide it up, and you can see what happens. Over time, the electrons collect and form the interference pattern. This is when both slits are open, okay? Now, let's turn the beam off and clear it. And now we're going to cover one of the slits so that only the left slit is open. And now we're going to turn our beam back on. Okay, now it's a single slit interference pattern that starts to emerge and you see a broad central maxima with no wiggles in it and then you see this maximum over here. I'm going to turn my firing rate up so that um, this happens a lot faster. You can see here we have a broad central maxima, no wiggles in it, and then here's the neighboring maximum. And you get a similar structure if you go to the right. Okay, here we have our broad central maximum and now it's in front of the right hand slit and then our secondary is there. But here's a question for you. If you look at this, okay, you can see that your left, right, and your right don't add up to what the interference pattern looks like when you have both slits open, okay? So this is really super interesting. Think about it from a particle perspective. Let's say that you've got not slits and electrons, but beach balls, and you're throwing it through two neighboring doors, right? Two doors in the same room. Well, if you throw your beach balls through door one, and you throw your beach balls through door two, and then you look at the beach balls that are scattered outside in the hall, you're going to see a pile in front of door one and a pile in front of door two. And then if you have both doors open and you simultaneously have a friend over here and a friend over there throwing beach balls out door one and door two, you're going to have a pile in front of door one and a pile in front of door two, right? It's not like you get a different structure of the piles if you only have one door open or the other door open versus both doors open at the same time. So this idea that it matters whether one slit is uncovered is very interesting and shows you the quantum nature of what's going on. This single slit versus double slit really illustrates the wave nature of the electron. In other words, it's the interference pattern that's generated. You wouldn't get this pattern, this interesting pattern right here, if your electrons only acted as particles. You have to have wave particle duality for that electron interference pattern to emerge. So this was a really, really, really interesting experiment um, in physics and caused people to really discuss what was going on. So basically, the electron wave acts as a wave front just like the light wave does, and it interacts with both slits simultaneously. If you make an attempt to determine experimentally through which slit the electron goes by covering up one slit, say, then that act of measurement destroys the interference pattern and you get your single slit interference pattern and not your double slit interference pattern. It's impossible to determine ahead of time which slit the electron will go through by covering one up, say, for example. This is very non-classical. So you have wave components of the electron are present at both slits at the same time, and this is for one particle. This is for one particle. The wave nature of that particle is present at both slits at the same time. Usually we think of particles as just having a trajectory and going through a slit, right? But that's not what's happening here. It acts just like a classical wave, which is really interesting. Okay, so let's look at this from a couple of different standpoints. First, let's look at diffraction through a particle view or a particle interpretation. So if you treat your electrons like particles, then the probability per unit volume or per unit area as you look at it on your screen of finding a particle in a particular region of space is proportional to the number of photons or electrons per unit volume at that time. So in other words, let's say that we had our screen up on the other side and we shot our electrons through the double slit and then the probability of the electron hitting a particular space on that screen, you could say that you add up the number of electrons that hit that area of the screen, here highlighted in yellow. You, you look at that number, and you divide it by the total number of electrons that hit your screen. And that would give you a probability that the electron would be, say, in this region A of space. All right? Okay. Now, if you look at a light interference pattern from a particle or a photon point of view, 
the idea should basically be the same. The arrival position of any one photon is unpredictable, yet clearly there are some positions where a photon is more likely to be detected, and those are the regions that are brighter on that photographic plate. If you view it in this way, there's absolutely no difference between small particles like electrons and the photons, okay? So if you think of the particle nature of your light, then you've got more photons striking your screen at certain points than others, and you could figure out what that probability is by counting the number of photons in that region and then dividing by the total number of photons on your screen. So photons and particles both can be counted like particles, and the probabilities for being in certain locations can be counted in that way. But the patterns that dictate what those probabilities are well, that's determined by their wave nature, which is dictated by the interference pattern that forms, that d sine theta is equal to n lambda, okay? So let's try to take this analogy of a particle wave function by looking at what we know classically about electromagnetic waves. Let's see if we can get that, pardon the pun, to shed some light on the subject. Okay, so electromagnetic waves, light, are self-propagating, transversely oscillating electromagnetic fields. So what you have in an EM wave or light is you have an electric field that's perpendicular to a magnetic field, and the magnitude of the electric field oscillates in time, as does the magnetic field, and they're perpendicular to one another, and their oscillation is perpendicular to the direction that they're moving, the direction of propagation. So if the light is traveling in this direction, then the electric and magnetic fields are oscillating in the other directions, perpendicular directions. All right, now, we know that. So, if we look at electromagnetism and we figure out what the intensity of light is, the intensity is a power per unit area, and there's an expression um, that we can derive from classical um, physics, which is actually um, discussed more in your textbook, and it's equal to the square of the electromagnetic field of that wave, E0 squared, times the speed of light, times a constant, the primitivity of free space, epsilon naught, divided by two, okay? So basically, your intensity is proportional, linearly proportional to the square of your electric field, okay? Now, brighter spots in a light interference pattern have larger intensity, which means at that point, at the bright spots with high intensity, you have a larger electromagnetic field there, all right? That's the wave picture, okay? Proportional to the square of the electric field. But let's look at it now from the particle picture. An intensity is a power per unit area. That stays the same. A power is an energy per unit time, and now you divide by the area to get the intensity. And remember that the energy of a photon is equal to HF, so you have a single photon, and then in an interference pattern, you'd have a lot of them, so you'd multiply by the number of photons that you got n, okay, so you have n times h times f, and now divided by the time times the area. So n over ta here is the number of photons per unit time per unit area that are arriving at that screen. So the intensity of the pattern that you see is dictated by the number of photons that strike that screen over the time that you watch the screen, okay? So it's a number of photons. So here we have some wave particle duality aspects for light. The intensity of the pattern is dictated by the amplitude of the electromagnetic field, by the square of that electromagnetic field. Greater intensities mean larger electromagnetic field wave amplitudes, right? And that results in more particles striking the screen in those bright spots. So that's our wave particle duality. Now, this is a quote from your textbook. The best that we can do is to say that neither the wave nor the particle picture is wholly correct all of the time, and that both are needed for a complete description of the physical phenomena, and that in fact the two are complementary to each other. The correct explanation of the origin and appearance of the interference pattern comes from the wave picture, okay, that interference, right? And the correct interpretation of the evolution of the pattern on the film comes from the particle picture, the number of photons that strike that screen per unit time. All right, so this is wave-particle duality. So the idea here is that particles and waves both have this wave-particle duality, right? So for light, 
It's the electromagnetic field, the square of that electromagnetic field strength that dictates the interference pattern. And that electromagnetic field strength is what's oscillating in light, right? So then the question becomes, if matter is a wave two, what's waving for it, right? If it's the EM field, the electromagnetic field for light, what's waving in a particle wave? All right, so for electromagnetic radiation, the prob probability per unit volume of finding a particle associated with the radiation is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the associated EM wave, and that particle is the photon. This, I think we kind of have a grasp on. But for particle waves, the amplitude of the wave associated with the particle is actually a probability amplitude. All right, it's a probability of the particle's location that's waving, okay? And this is described by the wave function. The most typical symbol that I've seen in, across multiple textbooks for a particle wave function is symbolized by a psi, which is this pitchfork looking thing right here. That's symbolized by a psi. Now this is the same wave packet that we were talking about in the last lecture, the Roy wave packet, okay? The probability of the particle's location can be calculated from the intensity of the de Broglie wave, and the intensity is proportional to the square of that wave function, just like for electromagnetic light, where the intensity is proportional to the square of the electric or the magnetic field, right? When we calculate our probabilities for de Broglie waves, it's going to be the square of the amplitude of the de Broglie wave that becomes important, okay? All right, so. I'm going to leave you with that, and we'll talk more about this when I get back from my trip.